With the development of the Utah arm, new molding and fitting techniques were developed to provide consistency in electrode contact and translation of body motion to control the prosthesis. These techniques are shown in this presentation. You'll learn EMG testing for optimal electrode site selection, the molding technique for a transhumeral amputee, positive mold modification, and fitting the evaluation socket, resulting in a well-fitting dynamic prosthesis. Initially, obtain the patient's background information and etiology of the amputation or limb deficiency. The patient's vocational and avocational activities are very important. Along with these activities, the goals of the individual need to be evaluated so that prosthetic care can be tailored to meet these goals and needs. This is also a good time to identify the other members of the rehabilitation team, such as the prescribing physician, occupational therapist, physical therapist, case manager, and any psychological counselors or other providers who may be involved. Family members and other caregivers are also important to the patient's rehabilitation. A positive outcome requires close collaboration with the entire rehabilitation team. If a cosmetic glove is to be used, match with a color swatch. Avoid making this determination under fluorescent lighting. Outdoors is the best lighting for color matching. Examine and evaluate the patient's residual limb for any scarring, sensitive areas, skin grafting, or any other condition that will affect prosthetic fitting. Okay, come forward. Test and measure the patient's range of motion. Back, back as far as you can. Good, good. Relax. Now come all the way out. Good. Back down. Push forward. And perform manual muscle testing good. to determine the strength of the patient's glenohumeral joint. Okay, push out. Good, good, good. And note these findings. For EMG testing, we use the motion control Myolab 2. Ensure that the battery is fully charged before operating the Myolab. For triad preamps, install a triad adapter plug and attach the preamps to the adapter. Turn on the Myolab and set the gain switch to the times one position. Set the A and B electrode preamps to 3. By placing the electrode on the thenar muscle of the thumb and flexing, identify the A and B channel electrodes. The audio settings on the Myolab can also be used as a biofeedback device to monitor the signal. Set the A channel gain to 10 and the B channel to 0. The Myolab is now ready to evaluate EMG sites. Have the patient flex and extend the sound side elbow joint. As the patient does this, have the patient flex the biceps on flexion and the triceps on extension. Back down and extend. Have the patient imagine flexing and extending the phantom limb simultaneously with the sound limb. Do that again. Limb come up and flex. As the patient does this, palpate the residual limb, feeling for muscle contraction. Good, good. Back down. One more time. Okay. Now extend for me. Good, good. Starting with the biceps, place the A-channel electrode in line with the largest portion of the muscle. Have the patient flex and watch with you the EMG signal on the Myolab. Encourage the patient to maximize the signal. Be aware that dry skin may cause a poor signal. Electrode gel or tap water can be used to moisten the area of the electrode site. Good. Do that again. Next, move the electrode laterally and note the site with the highest signal and the total area in which a strong signal is found. Now move the electrode proximal and distal searching again for the highest signal. Mark this site and the entire area with a permanent marker 
or indelible pencil. If possible, mark more than one site within the area of strongest signal. If the muscle is too weak to register, set the electrode preamp gain to 5. If the signal is still too low, set the myolab gain to the times 10 setting. If the patient's signals are weak, or there is significant co-contraction, occupational therapy is very helpful for proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, or PNF, and EMG training. Information regarding PNF training can be obtained by contacting motion control. If, on the other hand, the signal overpowers the meter, change the myolab A gain to 5, which decreases the sensitivity by 50%. The myolab gain should be adjusted so the entire range of the scale is used. Note the electrode preamp gain setting and the myolab settings. Next, set the A-channel electrode gain to 0 and the B-channel gain to 10. Repeat the process using the B-channel electrode to find the tricep site. After you have found and marked the best sites and area for the triceps, set the A-channel gain to the settings you noted. Place the A-channel electrode over the marked bicep site and the B-channel electrode over the marked tricep site. Have the patient flex the biceps, then the triceps, with the goal being the independent contraction of each muscle, minimizing co-contraction. A differential between the A and B channels is the desired outcome. If there is a large degree of co-contraction, one muscle site may be moved to a weaker location to provide an improved differential signal. Once optimal sites have been determined, ensure that these sites will be contained within the prosthetic socket. If in doubt, investigate other myoelectric sites and mark those also. While holding the electrodes in place, have the patient move the shoulder through the range of motion and watch for inadvertent EMG signals. For measuring and molding, you will need a flat-bladed Ritz stick, outside calipers with a smooth surface, a tape measure, one-inch elastic, Yates clamps, cotton stockinette or tubigauze, an indelible pencil, bandage scissors, parting agent, four or six-inch rigid plaster for splint, and two rolls of four-inch elastic or rigid plaster. With the elbow flexed at 90 degrees, Measure the humeral section of the sound arm from the pectoralis tendon to the olecranon and posterior olecranon to thumb tip if a unilateral patient. This will give you correct measurements for the prosthesis length. With bilateral patients, charts can be used, but most likely the patient will determine what length is most functional. Palpate the head of the humerus and the spine of the scapula. Measure the anterior-posterior dimension with a pair of outside calipers with a smooth surface. Take this measurement from the head of the humerus to a point inferior to the spine of the scapula along the line of progression. Care must be taken with this measurement so that it is reproducible on the positive model. PTB calipers may also be used for this measurement. Next, a medial lateral or ML dimension is taken at the level of the axilla using a flat-bladed Ritz stick. When taking this measurement, be careful not to overly compress the tissue. The neurovascular bundle goes through this area, and care must be taken to not impinge on it. Finally, take circumference measurements of the residual limb, and note these findings. Have the patient seated comfortably, with the shoulders slightly below eye level of the practitioner, and drape the patient with a sheet to protect clothing. Examine the bony anatomy of the patient, locating the clavicle and a chromium process to the spine of the scapula. You can then locate your hand positions with the heel of one hand anteriorly at the head of the humerus, and posteriorly the index finger pressing slightly inferior to the spine of the scapula. Apply a liberal amount of parting agent to the axilla.
place a stockinette on the residual limb and cut and stretch to encompass the shoulder. Use one inch elastic and Yates clamps to hold the stockinette in place. Mark the clavicle, a chromium process, the spine of the scapula, and the border of the scapula. Measure one splint beginning just superior to the pectoralis tendon crosswise over the shoulder to the scapula. Make the splint using five to six layers of bandage. Measure a second splint from the latissimus dorsi crossing the opposite direction over the shoulder and clavicle beyond the head of the humerus. Wet the first splint and lay it in place. Wet the second splint and crisscross the first, making sure to encompass the shoulder and the entire scapula. Do not extend beyond the pectoralis tendon or the latissimus dorsi. Now mold the AP dimension. The posterior hand placement defines the angle of the spine of the scapula, with the index finger slightly inferior to the spine of the scapula. And the anterior hand placement defines the head of the humerus. Squeeze your hands together to define the AP dimension of the mold. A slight downward pull will minimize superior movement of the splint. Maintain consistent pressure to allow the splints to harden. Outside calipers may be used to define the AP dimension. Wrap the soft tissue portion of the arm with the 4-inch roll of Plaster of Paris bandage. The patient can slightly abduct the humerus to allow the practitioner to bring the roll flat through the axilla. Encompass the entire residual limb with 3 to 5 layers of plaster bandage. Place the fingertips of one hand in the axilla and gently push superior into the axilla. Too much superior force will be uncomfortable. Not enough will not demarcate the pectoral tendon and latissimus dorsi. Use the palm of the other hand to form the ML dimension of the mold. The contour of the humerus can be formed with this hand. At the same time, maintain the humerus in as much adduction as possible. Take note of the splints to ensure they have stayed in place and not shifted as you adduct the humerus. Take care not to deform the medial wall but form a flat surface medially. Once this plaster has hardened, remove the mold. Using outside calipers, make sure the mold has not spread. Note the AP dimension, the ML dimension, the W shape of the medial wall, and the posterior wall encompassing the entire scapula. Trim down the mold for ease of filling. Standard tools are used for modifying the positive model. Begin by removing material posterior in the area of the scapula. Do this at the same angle as the spine of the scapula, both from lateral to medial and superior to inferior. Next, remove material anterior at the head of the humerus. These two modifications will determine the AP dimension of the socket. For a patient with a large amount of soft tissue, more material can be removed. For the more bony patient, care must be taken not to impinge on the bony anatomy. As you modify down to this AP measurement, Remove plaster at the anterior trim line to prevent a large wing. As you remove this plaster, re-establish the trim line. Looking at the medial aspect of the model, note the W shape. Accentuate this shape. Establish the ML measurement and modify the model down to that measurement. In a case where the patient has a large amount of soft tissue, leave this dimension slightly larger than the measured amount, as the socket can be very difficult to doff if it is too tight. But if this dimension is too loose, abduction of the humerus will not translate to the prosthesis. 
measure circumferences. Areas over the electrode sites may be accentuated for improved electrode contact. Smooth the entire model. Fill any fingerprints in the axilla and accentuate the pectoralis tendon and latissimus dorsi. Notice the trim line follows around inferior to the clavicle with the AP tightened over the head of the humerus. Moving laterally, drop to the level of the deltoid. In the final socket, these can get as low as the insertion of the lateral deltoid. Posterior, the trim line follows the inferior spine of the scapula and encompasses the entire scapula. The trim line can always be made smaller in the evaluation socket. Finally, the medial wall follows the latissimus dorsi into the axilla and pectoralis tendon back around anterior. Don the evaluation socket and hold the socket as the harness will suspend it. Okay, the Evaluate the socket throughout range of motion. Okay, move your arm forward. Flexion. Good, good. Relax. Move your arm back. Extension. Good, good. Adduction, abduction, and rotation. Check for total contact, patient comfort, impingement at the clavicle, AP tightness, ML tightness, and check for comfort at the axilla. Attach the harness and use a plumb bob to establish vertical alignment of the socket in both frontal and sagittal planes. Mark the electrode locations on the evaluation socket. Attach the adjustable lamination collar slightly flexed from vertical. With slender patients, the lamination collar will be AB ducted slightly to perpendicular to the floor. For larger patients, the lamination collar will be slightly AD ducted to the shaft of the humerus. This keeps the axis of the elbow operating within the work envelope. Using the measurement from the pectoralis tendon to the olecranon, minus four inches, position the lamination collar directly under the socket. After installing the electrodes and attaching the prosthesis, reevaluate the fit, function, and control of the prosthesis and make any necessary improvements. These may include harness attachment points, harness type, changing AP or ML dimensions, socket adjustments to ensure electrode contact throughout range of motion, electrode site selection, and most importantly, patient comfort. You are now ready for the patient to operate the prosthesis. Okay, can you raise the elbow? Good, lower the elbow, raise the elbow, lower the elbow, raise the elbow halfway. Notice how the socket design provides translation of motion in abduction and adduction, flexion, extension, and especially rotational forces. Many times, individuals move objects toward the midline. The posterior wing provides stability for these rotational forces. Throughout this presentation, you have learned patient evaluation, EMG testing and evaluation, measurement taking, molding procedures, positive model modification, and evaluation of socket fitting for patients with a transhumeral amputation.